on behalf of uh, behalf of Jill and myself, um, my brother, Mayor Michael, my sister-in-law, Amy, on behalf of our father, Mr. Leon Wilds, who uh, unfortunately could not be here tonight, we want to wish a refor shlema. It is an honor to welcome all of you to what is now the 27th um, annual talk in memory of our mother, uh, Ruth Wilds, Aleh HaShalom, of blessed memory. Uh, we are privileged tonight to hear from one of the great Torah luminaries of our generation, uh, Rabbi Moshe Weinberger, uh, who honors us with his presence this evening. And Rabbi, I, I can't tell you what a tremendous achut, what a merit it is for us to have you with us. The Q&A just before, and now the opportunity to hear from you now. We thank you so much. We know how busy you are, and it means a great deal to us, to our family, and to our community. Uh, I want to thank Seth and Zahava Farbman, who generously sponsored tonight's event in honor of their Rebbe, Rabbi Weinberger. And I also want to recognize the presence of a couple of a few individuals. First, to welcome back Surgeon Kaylee. And I just wanted to mention that uh, Surgeon Kaylee, who are part of our fellowship team and big part of our community, moved to Teaneck, the holy city of Teaneck, and they're back here tonight. I just really want to thank Serge, who's been sponsoring our one-on-one -on -one learning, which is one of the most important things that we do here at MJE, is give the opportunity for those of us who perhaps didn't have the Jewish day school background to have a real chavruta, to have a study partner who's perhaps a little more learned, to be able to learn and to deepen one's Torah wisdom. I want to recognize the presence tonight of uh, dear friends and board members, Lee and Danny Waxman, um, and our other dear friends, um, former chairman of our board, Josh, and Beth Schwartz, who host so often the Waxmans, of course, too, to Anat and Gabe uh, Levy, um, other sponsors for this evening, Hannah Ringel, uh, my good friend Eddie Zarabi, um, my other friend Andrew Bluestein, and um, I want to welcome my mother's uh, oldest and dearest friends, Joyce Weitz and Evelyn Rockland. Long many, many years. Long time, not oldest. <laughs> I said that, that came out so wrong. I'm sorry. I'm going to pay for that. Uh, I want to acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, my dear colleagues, MJE, uh, who make everything here possible. Rabbi Ezra Cohn, who stands in the back, our COO, our fearless leader, who also runs our MGE downtown. <laughs> Rabbi Penny Rosenthal, who uh, heads up our senior fellowship program, Hani, Hani Perlman, and Aaron Bluestein, uh, new on the staff, uh, who run our one-on-one -on -one learning program. Rabbi Avi Heller, who's uh, in charge of MG East, and our fellows, Rabbi Moshe and Shana Davis, and uh, Rabbi Kevin and Allison, uh, who I have the zuchus all of to work together with, also Dr. Dina Berkowitz, and I believe Rabbi Daniel Bortz, who I saw, joined the team MGE downtown. Thanks also to Rachel, to Leah, Andrew, and Deborah for their work on tonight and everything that happens at MGE. It takes a village. Before I have the honor of introducing Rabbi Weinberger, I just want to say a brief word uh, about Pesel Avigal Bat Menachem, uh, my mother, Allah Shalom, our mother, in whose memory... Uh, this organization was established, and our program tonight is dedicated. So next week is Hanukkah, and we're going to hear some great words of wisdom, of depth from Rabbi Weinberger about Hanukkah. But next Friday night, we're going to have the opportunity, the only night of the year, to be able to light two sets of candles. The regular Shabbos candles that we use to usher in the sanctity of Shabbat, and then, of course, the menorah, the Hanukkiah. And it might feel as though we're just lighting more candles, but these two types of candle lighting, I don't want to call them rituals, uh, mitzvah, really represent two different aspects and two different worlds in Judaism. Shabbos candles are there for our home. They're there to literally illuminate our home from within. And we're supposed to benefit. So if you light the Shabbos candle in one room and you don't get any benefit from it, it's not a great thing. We're really supposed to light it where you eat your meal, where you could really benefit from the light. Some are even of the opinion that you should turn off an electric light, 
put on the electric light, and because that's the way we illuminate our homes, it's really for our homes. The menorah is very different. The menorah is a candle, candles, but they're not for our material benefit. In fact, one of the songs we sing, the Aneret Alalu, we say, that we don't even have, we're not supposed to have any kind of hana'a from any kind of um, physical benefit from the candles because they're supposed to symbolize the miracle and the victory of the Hanukkah holiday, which is why we put the menorah on the window sill so everyone else can see it. Which is more important? Let's say you can't do both. Now, this is a real situation for some people. Um, the Rambam discussed this, the great Maimonides, if a person is poor and cannot afford candles for both Shabbat and Hanukkah, which one? So the Rambam says that we use Shabbos candles and we forgo the Hanukkah. Why? Mishum Shalom Beisel. Because Hanukkah, excuse me, because Shabbos candles creates shalom bias, peace within the home. And as important as Prasume Nisa is to publicize this miracle, and the great Maimonides called the mitzvah of Hadlakas Neiras for Hanukkah a mitzvah chaviva, a very special mitzvah. It's not to be taken lightly. We have to project our light onto the world. Nonetheless, Shalom Bayez, the peace within the home, is considered more important. And I share this idea because it was really the role that our mother, Allah Shalom, played for us in our lives. She was all about creating warmth, love, and Torah spirituality in our home. She cared about other people. She was very involved in communal events and programs. I used to see her schlepping around with the furniture and collecting clothing. We had a lot of Russian Jews that came, I remember, in the 70s and the 80s to Forest Hills, Queens, where I'm from, and she was very involved in the community, but that was really not what defined her. Her main focus was internal. And it, it could have been the big things internally, like, you know, making sure that my brother and I developed in the right way, that we developed the right character traits, she was always intent on my father, Yibadel Chaim, always learning with us that he should reinforce what our teachers and our rabbis were teaching us in school, or just the little things. You know, the chocolate cake uh, with the icing that she knew I loved, and my brother's obsession with her apple pie. She used to leave these little posted, little yellow posted notes. We had them back then uh, on our lunch boxes or on the tin foil. We went through huge amounts of tinfall for some reason. And, you know, have a nice day. I love you. Um, she was just so sweet and caring. And she created such light for us in our home growing up. And people felt that when they came. Um, when I started getting into this work, I was a rabbinical student at Yeshiva University. And I started this beginner service in Forest Hills. And, uh, you know, part of the whole program here is we invite you home. You know, you don't just come for the davening, for the service. You get a nice Shabbos lunch afterwards. So I was single. The only place I could bring them to was my family. <laughs> I didn't have a problem with that. My mother, Elva was a was a real yekka, if anybody knows what it means to be a German Jew. She ran a tight ship. Our home was like a bit of a museum, no, no shoes in the house, slippers. And, but she got over that very quickly in order to open up her home and her heart to other people. And she had this rare combination of elegance and warmth that was just such a, a winner around her Shabbos table. And so when someone asked me just last week, how did MGE start? I said, really, it just started around uh, our Shabbos table. It was our family's attempt after she passed away to sort of, I guess, mass produce that warmth and that love for Torah and for Yiddishkeit. And we've always, since we started MJ in 1998, we've always had someone 
during the week calling our participants. Would you like to go to the Schwartz's for Shabbos? Would you like to go to the Levy's for Shabbos? Want to go to the five towns, spend Shabbos at the Waxman's? Jill's been doing that for the last couple of years here, besides cooking for 15 to 20 people at our own home. And it's an unbelievable thing because between that and our big Shabbos dinners that Rabbi Ezra coordinates, we're doing one in each site of the, the city once a month. So almost every Friday night, there's about 100 young Jewish professionals enjoying the Shabbos meal. And we did the math. Between all of this in 24 years, there have been over 25,000 young Jewish men and women that have experienced Shabbos with MJE. 25,000. And this is not... This does not include the hundreds more that come on our retreats and our classes and one-on-one -on -one learning and travel with us to Israel every summer. By the way, there's an opportunity to, you can just click, what do we call those things? To make a donation, what do you call it? A QR code, if anybody wants to do it, I'm sorry. I would be remiss. Um, but because of this, there are literally hundreds of our alumni that are leading lives of Torah and mitzvot, sending their kids to day schools, yeshivot, because they've been exposed to the beauty of Shabbos in our, in our community. And that's why it's so fitting to have Rav Weinberger here tonight, because perhaps more than any other rabbinic personality of our generation, Rabbi Weinberger has created literally a spiritual revolution inspiring tens of thousands of Jewish people of all ages to see the warmth, the depth, and the beauty of Judaism. The rabbi's erudition and his scholarship are legendary. His grasp of what we call the nigla and the nistar, the revealed parts of the Torah, and the more hidden or mystical parts of our Judaism is astounding. And by sharing that with us and schlepping here on a weeknight, he has opened up new avenues of Jewish knowledge to make it accessible to so many Jews that are thirsty for more Torah and Yiddishkeit in their lives. And I want to thank you, Rabbi, in advance, because we, the MG educators, we owe you a debt of gratitude. Since we're all your students, we all listen to your Torah, we go on your podcast, and we try to get there as often as I can. I, you know, our family spent many summers in the five towns. Um, I would come to your shul to get that boost and to experience the incredible energy and not just your wonderful Torah presentations, but the level of kavana and focus and joy of people davening at Esh Kodesh. We've copied as much as, as much as we could here in the city of what you do there. And Rabbi Weinberger has to get back, so I'm going to stop speaking, because he has to meet with people. He spends a lot of time not just learning and teaching, but helping real people. Rabbi Weinberger has lit a fire. He's been successful not only inspiring Jews to become more committed or more observant, but to really fall in love with Judaism. And this is something we desperately need, because if Torah is going to be attractive, to more Jewish people, then there need to be more of us in love with it. But not for other people, for ourselves, for our own spiritual connection. If we want Judaism to be a vibrant part of our lives, and please God, one day, our children. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in showing honor and rising and welcoming Rabbi Moshe Weinberger. I'll be honest with you, I usually, I usually detest introductions, but that was so sweet. It was just so sweet. Not about the stuff about me, which is very, very exaggerated, but about, about your mother. And I wish, I'm sure many of you wish we would have known her. 
but we get a taste of her the second you walk into this place. I felt I felt like walking into a walking into a home. You know, I think this is the second time or third time I've been in Manhattan. Not counting Washington Heights, it's a separate zone. <laughs> but in Manhattan, maybe second or third time in 30 years, I, I am not really here. One of the first places I took my uh, my wife when we were dating was uh, to go see Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway. <laughs> That's a memorable time in Manhattan. But I feel like this is a holy place. In the middle of in the middle of New York, there's this holy island of calmness, of sweetness, of authenticity. I'm going to talk to you about Hanukkah a little bit. But you know, you reminded me, Rabbi Wilds, when you were talking about one of the great teachings of one of the great Hasidic masters, Rabbi Leibel Eger. I'm sure that many of you know that originally, and ideally, the Hanukkah menorah is lit not in the window, but it's lit actually by the door outside or in the doorway leading to the world. And if you've been, if you've been in Yushalayim in Jerusalem this time of the year, you'll actually see many of those menorahs that are lit in that way. And Reb Label Eger explained on a deeper level where that comes from. We know that we're publicizing the miracle and so on. But even if you're by yourself and there's really no public passing by, what's the point of lighting the menorah in the doorway in such a way? So we're reading now in the Torah, these Shabbos is we're reading about, about Joseph, about Yosef. And you know that Joseph was taken away from his parents. And for many years he was missing. He disappeared from their lives. We can't imagine only a parent who has lost a child, God forbid, could imagine, can understand what that means. So Blabel Eger said that Every night, Yaakov Avinu, our father Yaakov, would go outside with a candelabra and would search out in the, in the darkness to see maybe, maybe, maybe Yosef's coming home. Maybe he's coming home. There was a song that one of the Israeli songwriters came up with when, those, when the boys were missing. You remember a few years ago, the boys that were killed? Those beautiful boys that were killed. And there's an Israeli songwriter that wrote a song of the mother waiting by the door, Od Ma'at Ataba. You know the song? Od Ma'at, soon, soon you're going to come home. This place is like a light in, the, in Manhattan, a light in New York City that's welcoming Jews to come home. The wonderful rabbis and rabbisons, men and women who work with you here, they're looking out into the darkness, waiting for you to come. I know there are modern ways of advertising and promoting, but really that's what it's all about. For Hashem's children to return to him, he, he, he's waiting for us to come home. He misses us. <laughs> Hanukkah is a homecoming. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes about that. What Hanukkah means to me, Around 250 years ago, there was a very righteous and holy person that was in this world. We call him the Baal Shem Tov. How many of you have ever heard of the Baal Shem Tov? Okay. Well, Hashem. The Baal Shem Tov, I can't talk about him. But I'll just share with you a tiny little story to begin. Every now and then, the Baal Shem Tov would all of a sudden go into the study hall and we pick a few of the guys, the students, the Hasidim, and say, come with me. And, they, and he would take them on some mysterious, magical journey. Oftentimes they had no idea where they were going, what they were doing. Only afterwards, the Tzaddik, the Holy One, the Baal Shem Tov, would reveal to them the purpose of that trip. So it was 
it was a freezing, freezing cold day in the winter. In the Ukraine, it gets very, very cold. It was freezing. It was the time of the holidays, the non-Jewish holidays, this time of the year. And the Baal went and he called on a couple of the guys who were going. That was the greatest honor. And they ran to go with the Rebbe. And they were going in a sled with horses. And they came to a, to a place outside of the town. The town's called Mezhbiz. I've been there a number of times. And they came to a very big lake. And there were hundreds and hundreds of peasants of the locals that were standing around this lake. And there was some sort of a winter festival that was going on. Apparently it was popular in those days, maybe it's still done. But in those days, it was a popular pastime than it was the, when it was the holidays of the winter. They would go skating on the lake. And the children would skate and they would etch into the ice their religious symbols of crosses, crucifixes, and oftentimes some anti-Semitic slogans as well that were popular then and are becoming back in style again. And the Baal Shem Tov and his students were on the sled and they were heading past that place of the lake. And the Baal Shem Tov told the driver to go, to go to the lake. And the students were... The students were very surprised. They were very shocked by that. They didn't want the holy eyes of the Baal Shem Tov to see what was taking place there. But the Baal Shem Tov insisted. So they went there and the Baal Shem Tov got out of the wagon, the sled, and he walked over and, and all the peasants, the non-Jews, he was very famous. They knew who he was. He was a, a great healer and a miracle worker. And they used to come to him also. As much as they hated Jews, they had a certain respect and fear of the Baal Shem Tov. And the Baal Shem Tov walked over to the edge of the lake and he was watching the children skating and etching crosses in the ice. And the Baal Shem Tov was watching this very intensely and his students who had come with him could not understand why he would ever want to watch this. And after a few minutes, the Baal Shem Tov said, that's enough. And he went and they returned to the study hall. And one of the students had the courage to ask the Baal Shem Tov, Rebbe, what was the purpose of that trip? Why did the Rebbe want to see that? The Baal Shem Tov said the following. He said that water is the source of life in this world. That's what God created to give us life. But water gives life as long as it's alive, as long as it's warm and flowing. But if the water freezes, then it's only a matter of time until crosses are etched into it. And then he went on to explain that when a chas and a kala, when a bride, a groom and a, a bride and a groom stand under the chuppah, under the wedding canopy, there's so much love, and they're looking forward to a life together, to raise a family together. But somehow, the Baal Shem Tov said, somehow, months and years pass, and the water begins to freeze. Sometimes to the point that these two people who were once desperately in love can't look at each other and, they, and the negativity becomes etched into the ice of their lives. Their lives have become frozen. A child is born in a family and everybody is so excited. Mazel tov, mazel tov, mazel tov. And then you can see this kid, he's a teenager now. Teenagers require, for the most part, quite a bit of maintenance. <laughs> and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but... This child who was once adored by his parents has now become a challenge to their sanity. 
and happiness. And that relationship between the parents and the child has frozen. It's a long winter that people feel with their children, with each other. It's the same thing in the relationship that many Jews have with God. That those who are raised in religious homes and felt the presence of God in their lives, that somehow it happens over the years. Oftentimes it happens that the water just, the lake freezes. The davening, the praying is empty. The holidays are just excuses to take off from work and to eat a lot. I remember maybe it's 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that my grandchildren were, were watching on the computer a cartoon, I think it was called Frozen or The Frozen. You heard of it? Yeah? I guess, I guess they weren't the only ones that saw it. So I didn't see it. I, I sat with them for five minutes. And it's not too hard to pick up the, uh, the theme. Pretty much all of the Disney stuff and all these, uh, I, I don't know, maybe it's not Disney, I, I, I don't know. But all of those, all of those shows and cartoons, they pretty much have the same theme. But it seemed that there was a very wonderful princess, or some important girl. That, that everything that she was touching became ice. And, there was, and the whole tachlis, the whole objective, the whole point of the story was to, was to help warm up and to thaw. All that had been frozen should, should be able to melt. And for her to be able to live a life of warmth. It's a very, it was a very Hasidish uh, movie. <laughs> and even though I didn't see the whole thing, I tried to talk to the grandchildren about some of these ideas. There's a reason why Hanukkah comes in the winter. There's, there's a reason why at least here in New York, it started to get cold again. Maybe not in California. Maybe not in Miami. And even though, though, even though those are wonderful places to live and they're attractive, but Hanukkah, I like to be in New York. Better in Eretz Israel, in Israel, but if we have to be away, to be in the cold of New York. Rabbi Wilds mentioned a comment that's made by Maimonides, by the Rambam, that's absolutely astonishing. It's very easy to miss it. He mentioned the word. But the Rambam writes, Maimonides writes, Mitzvah Sneh Chanukah, Mitzvah Chaviva Hi Ad Ma'od. The Mitzvah of the Chanukah candle is very beloved, chaviva. Chaviva means dear to us. It's beloved. The Rambam doesn't write that about sitting in a sukkah. He doesn't write that even about Shabbos. Even though, as you all know, those are laws that go back all the way to Moshe, to Moses, and to Mount Sinai. Those are laws from the Torah. Chanukah is the last holiday. Hanukkah is at the time of the second temple. And yet, Davke, here, the Rambam uses, and he's very careful, those of you who have studied Maimonides, every word, he's very careful with his choice of words. Chavivihi ad ma'od. It's the dearest mitzvah to the Jewish people. You know, I have, I have such joy when I'm driving someplace, going around, you're going through different neighborhoods, and you see the holiday decorations, which I happen to think are pretty. I mean, I'm not officially allowed to say that. <laughs> but I always enjoyed seeing them when I was a kid. And you're going through a neighborhood, and every now and then you see a menorah in the window, right? 
I'm not talking about a heavily populated Jewish neighborhood uh, that's filled with menorahs, but you're going through a neighborhood that's not Jewish. And then every now and then you see a menorah, and that, Jews, that Jew has that menorah, whether it's electric or it's uh, regular menorah, that Jew is saying to the whole world, in this house there lives a Jew. You know, Passover is called Passover because it says that God passed over the Jewish homes, right? In Egypt. And one of the great rabbis, Rabbi Moshe Lefsasev, has said that the word Pesach or Pasach also means to dance. And he said that when Hashem would come to a Jewish home, he would do a little dance, and then he would move on. And when I go through the neighborhoods and I see that there's a menorah in the window, I want to get out of the car and do a little dance. I actually did that once, to the horror of, of my children, because I saw the owner of the house was outside, was closed, and I ran over to him, and I did a little dance with him. Because Hashem would say when he came to a Jewish home, in this home there lives a Jew. There's a Jew in this home. And Hashem was so excited he would do a dance. What is the chavivas? What is it that's so dear? That even a person who otherwise is very assimilated and very, very far removed from observance, but yet he tenaciously holds on to the menorah. And to say, that well, it's the winter season, that's selling us very short. This is something that's been even where they're not, but that's not the holiday of the winter at all. In other places with other religions, Jews have held on to Hanukkah fiercely. According to the Kabbalists, every mitzvah corresponds to a different part of our bodies. I'm not going into the to the list, but the human image corresponds to the mitzvahs of the Torah. Some are obvious, like the tefillin on the head, the arm, and so on, again, without going into any details. But each mitzvah somehow is related to a different part of who we are and has a curative effect upon the person who observes that mitzvah. That part of who he is or who she is is affected by the observance of that mitzvah. And even if he or she can't, some mitzvahs can only be kept in Israel. Some mitzvahs can only be kept by Kohanim, by priests, or Levim, by Levites. Nevertheless, the mitzvahs somehow, the mitzvahs, Hashem's mitzvahs reach the organs, the limbs of, of who we are. But when it comes to the Hanukkah candle, we've been taught there's a verse that was said by King Solomon. Shlomo Melech said, Ne'er Hashem nishmas adam choyfes kol chadre button. That means the candle of God is the soul of man. And the Kabbalists taught that that's referring to the Hanukkah candle. So all the other mitzvahs of the Torah are able to help out the hands, the eyes, the ears. But the Hanukkah candle reaches the soul. Ne'er Hashem nishmas adam. That means, as the Kabbalists have taught, that the Hanukkah candle somehow restores our souls. We're disconnected, we're detached over the long winter of our exile, Jews have become detached from their souls, from their very essence. The essence of a Jew is his soul, is the nefeshal kiss, is the godly soul. But over the winter, in the freezing cold exile, over thousands of years, many, many of our souls have become frozen, have been infected, been touched by some witch of Western or Eastern civilization and has become frozen. And somehow Hanukkah is near Hashem Nishmas Odom, that the Hanukkah candle has the ability not just to warm the Jewish soul, to melt the ice that surrounds our Jewish souls. 
to revive the Jewish soul. And the question is, how? How does Hanukkah do that? How is that possible? So I want to tell you something very interesting. I think many of you know that there's a particular question regarding the amount of candles that we light that has challenged the greatest scholars for many, many years. And the question is, why do we light eight candles? The miracle was only how many days? Seven. There was oil for one day. So really, the miracle was seven days. It was enough for that first day. So there are many, many books that are written. And every year there are new answers that rabbis and teachers, men and women, scholars come up with. There was a, there was a fellow in Williamsburg that they were sending around a clip a couple of years ago that he said the reason we light seven and not eight is due to COVID. <laughs> he didn't explain. He just said it to the boys and the boys just looked at him. They had a clip of the class of these little chassidish boys in Williamsburg. And he said, he was talking Yiddish and he said, and the answer and the terrorists is due to COVID. Because everything seemed to be due to COVID. But the question's a good question. Why set, why eight candles? It should be seven candles. Thousands of answers. My favorite answer is found in the writings of the Prichadash. Some others also suggested this. The state of the Jewish people at that time was the lowest it had ever been since we received the Torah. The rate of assimilation of Hellenization was off the charts. Whatever statistics we're looking at about assimilation, Hellenization, which was leading to assimilation, and there was already a lot of assimilation, was tearing the Jewish people apart. And we were frozen. And as a result of, of that Hellenization, the vast majority of Jews felt that the creator of the world was fed up with them. That because of their many sins committed during that winter time of exile, while we still had the temple standing, that due to our many sins that Hashem the God was no longer the God of Israel, that Hashem was sick and tired of us, that Hashem wanted to have nothing more to do with us. And that that romance that began with our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, sorry, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah, that romance that continued on with the giving of the Torah, I seen I was finished. That God was done with us. And because of that, God himself allowed his holy temple to be completely defiled. And idols were brought. Crucifixes. Not actually crucifixes, but idols. Idolatry was brought into the temple. Carved into the, into the, into the holiest of places. And Jews began through the efforts of that one family, the Chashmanoi. They believed that it was possible to still find perhaps some trace of God's love. That maybe God still cares about us, even though to a large extent we've abandoned him. Maybe he still cares about us. And this rabbi taught that we light eight candles because the greatest miracle of all was not that the candle continued to light. That was, as they would say now, that was cool. But that wasn't the greatest miracle of all. The greatest miracle of all is when a person looks at his life 
and his life is a total wreck, is a shambles. And he's done everything to hurt the Creator. He's done everything to hurt the people that he loves. And he feels that at this point, due to his mistakes, he's lost, he's abandoned, he's despised and hated. And suddenly, they found in the ruins of the desecrated temple. The building was standing, but they found in the, in the filth of the desecration that took place there, they found a jar of pure oil with the seal of the high priest that had miraculously escaped the sight of those of our enemies who had come and who had intentionally defiled everything that was in the temple. So this rabbi, the Prichadosh, taught that when the Jewish people saw that, when that jar of oil was found, and that Hashem was saying to us, Kindelach children, I know you think that it, at this point I can't stand you anymore, that I hate you. You think that I no longer care about you and I'm no longer waiting in the dark for you to come back to me. It's not true. And I want you to light the menorah. And we were thinking, we should light the menorah? People like us should light the menorah? We are the most impure people. We've been so distant from you. We haven't kept your commandments. We've done everything to imitate our enemies. What that jar of oil was to the Jewish people, and it still is, whether it's consciously or unconsciously is, that reassurance in the life of a child who feels dejected and rejected, that reassurance that his mother, that his father, has never for a moment stopped looking for him in the darkness, has never for a moment stopped waiting for him to come back, has never for a moment stopped loving him. Rabbi Waz was talking about his mother, Allah Shalom. And my wife, she used to send the kids off when they were little with lunch bags and she would put smileys on them. And she would write to each of the kids a little note. Not every day, but often she would send them off to school in that way. And when they were older, the kids would say that there they were in exile in some horrible teacher's classroom. <laughs> and the clock wasn't moving. And the day was never going to end. And it was their worst subject. And they didn't do their homework and there was a quiz in the next ten minutes. And there was no point in going on with life. And then you reach into your little knapsack, the little girl, because we have six girls and a boy, who have Rosh Hashanah, their own families. And they reach into the knapsack and pull out a lunch bag, and Mommy wrote a little note to each of them, a personal note. Chumi, I'm thinking about you. Shani, you're the sweetest girl in the world. Keep on smiling, you're going to be home soon. The kids said that they gave them their neshamas back, their souls. That gave them their souls back. The hardest thing for a child is to feel. I don't think I. I don't think I ever recuperated from that first day of school that I went to school. That we had a. We had a. To have our names. A little thing. It was my school was in Jamaica, Queens. Did you ever hear that place? It's a rough place to start. Yeshiva Central Queens in Jamaica. The only one who was crying more than me was my mom. <laughs> and it was embarrassing because she had to walk me into the school and she was holding me and kissing me the whole time. I don't think that any of us have really recuperated from that. My mother, she should be well as 93 years old. I was with her before I came here. She doesn't remember that much these days. But one of the things she comes back to almost every time that I'm there these past few weeks is that moment when Mangala took her mother away from her. My mother was in Auschwitz. And my mother was at that time maybe 14 or 15. And the last thing that she saw was her mother being pulled away and screaming for her mother and her mother reaching towards her 
And that was the last that she saw her mother. And, and that's what she talks about not now when she's 93 years old, when she doesn't really remember much else what happened to her in her life. But she remembers that moment of her mother being taken from her. That moment of separation that she hasn't spoken about because over the years that when she was well, her consciousness was in control. But now she's a little girl again. That reassurance that Hashem gives, that God gives to a person. Kilo e'ezavcha. That Hashem said to our father Jacob Yaakov. That you're going to go through some hard times. But I'm not going to leave you. And even when you don't see my presence, I'm with you. Even if you don't see me, I'm with you. I'm never ever going to take my eyes off of you. I promise you. I'm with you. Now, before Shabbos ends, we have a custom to have the third meal, and we sing Mizmor David, the 23rd Psalm, and we say the words, Gam Kael Begates Amoves, even though I walk through the valley of, of death, I'm not afraid. Why? Ki? Ate Imadi. Because I have a lunch bag with Hashem Smiley on it. Because you're with me, you haven't left me. There's a teaching, it's late, and I, I don't want to take so I know it's, it's, you have to get home, it's late. But there's a teaching from the great Saudi Rabbi Nachman from Breslov, it's the Balshamta's great grandson. For those of you who have Lukut Imran, if you look in Kuf Tzadikai, the 195th teaching in the first volume, the whole teaching is just really one run on sentence, a couple of lines. The verse is in Psalms. The fourth chapter, but Tsar Hirchavta Li. That King David was saying that I was in a narrow place. Tsar means in a tight, narrow, difficult place. And in that difficult place of my life, Hirchavta Li, you opened up an expansiveness for me. And the Rebbe explains, That means that even when a Jew is going through some time of darkness in his life, a difficulty in life, Hashem is Baruch Marachiv Lanu. Look carefully, look deeply into that time of your life, and you will find that lunch bag. You will find Hashem Smiley. You will find a sign of God's presence in that miserable time that you're going through. Yestakal Adam Hashem. Look deeply and carefully at the signs of God's love and kindness that are there during that time of your difficulty. Just like when Joseph was taken down in this week's. Parsha, Joseph was taken down to Egypt. So our sages tell us that he was taken down in a wagon that was selling perfume. And everybody's asking, Rabbi Chaim Shalab, it's many rabbis spoke about this, like why did he have to be taken down at all? So they make a big deal that usually at that place, at that time, the wagons that were there were, were with leather and things that smelled terrible, tanning leather that smelled horrible. But God loves Yosef so much that he was taken down to Egypt in a wagon that rarely passed by those places where they, were, where they were carrying perfume. So I remember I heard that when I was around eight or nine years old, that my teacher said that. And I remember thinking, hey, why do you have to go down to Egypt at all? If you, you know, if you really want to help the guy out. <laughs> so he got taken down in a perfumed wagon. That's not what it means. And that's not what the rabbis were teaching us. There was a reason at the time it was not understood. And maybe we still don't understand it entirely. But that's not for tonight. Why was it that Joseph had to go down to Egypt? There was a very deep reason for that. And without that, we would not be surviving in exile. If had he not gone down. So it was decreed that he had to go down. But there could be that feeling that God has forsaken me and God has forgotten about me. And he doesn't care about me. And God was saying to him, you must go down to Egypt now, but you're going to go down in style. Meaning... I want you to look carefully. That's what Rabbi Nachman is saying. At this time of your life, look at the kindnesses that you have in your life. Look at the good that you have in your life. You will see that even during that time that God, for his reasons that He only he knows, he's bringing this calamity upon you. Even in the calamity itself. 
Hashem is Baruch Marchiv Lo. Hashem is Baruch is giving you a kiss during that difficult time. He's sending you a little note during that difficult time, a post-it, like you had from your mom. Mavad Mashon of of course, we dive in and we long that all the difficulties should end and Hashem should bring us back to Him, back to Yerushalayim. So that's exactly, Hever, please forgive me for taking so long. That's exactly what was happening at that time in history. We found ourselves in a state of horrible assimilation, Hellenization, the spiritual emptiness, the darkness. It had never been anything like that since we received the Torah. And because of that, we were convinced that God had abandoned us. He had left us. And perhaps we deserved it. Finding that jar of oil, finding that menorah in the neighborhood, when you're driving through a non-Jewish neighborhood, and you see there's that person that plugged in some electric menorah and lit it up and wanted to say, do in this place, lives, a Jew lives in this place. Remember me, master of the world, you remember me? Stop here and do a little dance by my house. My house is not kosher. I don't keep Shabbos. It could be this mezuzah is here for the last hundred years and it's been painted over 12 times. But I'm a Jew. Do you remember me? The same way that they found that jar of oil when we all thought that you had forgotten us, you had abandoned us. And then you showed us that I'm here with you and I want your mitzvah. Your mitzvah is important to me. You don't keep Shabbos, you don't keep kosher, you don't keep Passover, you don't keep... Your, your candle is important to me because as long as you light that candle, it means that you still have a soul that's on fire and you want to come back, you want to return home. You don't know how, you can't now, whatever it is. And when you're going through a difficult time, you feel that he's left you. You know, we have the dreidel. And it's an old custom to spin the dreidel. And the letters of the dreidel, Neis Gadol Hayasham, there was a great miracle that happened over there. Nun Gimel, Hey Shin. You can't see the letters when it's spinning. Do you ever feel that way? There are so many days in my life that I feel like a mamisha dreidel. And then my whole life has become one big dreidel. And because of that, I'm not stopping to look at my children. It's such an interesting thing. I, 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 I felt this last week. I was driving someplace, and I saw one of my kids with one of my grandchildren walking on the street, a little bit further away from where we live. And I, like, screeched. I almost caused a whole accident. And I screeched to call out from the car. Surrey, Surrey. But I see her all the time. I mean, we live nearby and she stops over almost every day. But, you know, I didn't think I was going to see her. I didn't expect to see her. We were in, in Yushalayim in Jerusalem a few weeks ago. We had a trip from the shul that was to Italy, and then we went to Jerusalem. And my youngest daughter lives in Yushalayim with her husband, and our, a couple, three of our grandchildren. And we got there late, and I didn't think that I was going to see her the night that we got there. And we went with a couple of the chevrit to eat. And, and, and I turned around, and I saw that the people were looking funny at me, and I realized something was going on. I turned around, I see my shifi over there, my youngest. Shifi. You see, we don't stop the dreidel. You have to stop the dreidel. We have to look at the love that Hashem is showing us, at the smiley, at the, at the blessings, the brachas that we have in our lives. We have to stop the dreidel and look at it. As long as it's spinning, you don't see it. We're so busy. We're so busy with good things, with all kinds of things. That we're not able to see. We're not able to be still and hold those things in our life that are the brachas that Hashem is sending us, the smileys. We're surrounded with smileys that we don't even notice. 
We're surrounded with post-its from Hashem, from God. Personal post-its from God that we don't even see. So I want to share with you something very personal, which I've begun to talk about more since my father passed away a few years ago. My father was, was not in Auschwitz. He was in a different place called Matthaus. Maybe you heard of it. It was more brutal than Auschwitz. Not that we can compare these things, but that's what they say. I tell this story, I've told it already publicly a number of times. I was uncomfortable. I didn't really say it when my father was alive because he wouldn't have been happy. But after he passed away, I feel that it's a mitzvah. I tell every boy before his bar mitzvah in shul, when I meet with a boy, I tell him this story. A month before my bar mitzvah, so some of you might know it, I think it was written up in Mishpacha magazine a couple of years ago also. Because somebody had heard about it, and they came to speak to me about it. It was a month before my bar mitzvah, it was the, it was the first day that I was supposed to put on tefill. Many have the custom to put on a month before the bar mitzvah. And I was all excited because I had a brand new pair of tefillin. And we were going to go to shul, and I was going to show off my new tefillin, I was a big boy. And we didn't, we were going to go to shul, and my father said, I want you to sit down for a few minutes. I want to talk to you. Okay. Then my father gave me his tefillin, and he said, Moshe, I want you to put on my tefillin. I want you to put these tefillin on. So I said, but daddy, I want, to put my, I want to put my tefillin on. I have, you bought me new tefillin. I'm going to go to shul, put my tefillin on. And besides, I'm a lefty. <laughs> and you're a righty. It's a different, it doesn't go. I mean, you could finagle with it, but it's not easy. My father said, never mind, it's okay. You're not 13. You put it on the other arm. And I said, okay. I saw that he was very, very... Uh, serious about this. I didn't know why. And I put on his tefillin. You're very, very old. From 1936. So I put on his tefillin. And then he said, now listen to me. When the Germans came to our city, all the older people and the women were put into the ghetto, and the children, the healthy young men, were taken off to slave labor camps. From there, they eventually, most of them eventually went to concentration camps. First, they were taken to slave labor. Hungarian slave labor camps. So my father told me that that the parents walked with their sons to the train station that was still within the area of the ghetto. So the parents were allowed to walk there. And my grandfather, who I'm named after, Hashem should avenge his blood, that my grandfather said to my father, my father told this to you, that, that my father told me, my father said to me, that we're not going to see each other ever again in this world. And my father told me that he began to cry and say, why are you saying that? We heard the Americans are only a few miles away. The Russians are, are not far away. The war is ending. My father's father, my grandfather told my father, look, we're not going to see each other again. But my grandfather, my father said that his father told him, you make sure that no matter what, you put on your tefillin, your phylacteries, you put them on every day, no matter what happens. You put them on every day. Don't miss a day of tefillin. And you'll survive. And at 120, we'll see each other again. 
Those are the last words that he heard from his father. And my father, talking about the miracle of Hanukkah, my father put on tefillin in Mauthausen every day. Not only did he put on the tefillin every day in Mauthausen, but there were hundreds and hundreds of other Jews, most of whom were killed eventually, who were also putting on the tefillin. They would take turns. They would say, Shema. And they had to make sure they not get caught. If you get caught, you get killed right away if you have to. And they would say, Shema. They were standing on line. These starving, dying Jews were standing on line, and they were all fighting for my father's tefillin. Many years later, there was a museum in Yushalayim that wanted to buy these tefillin. They heard about them. It's filmed from Atazan. It's been written up in a few places. It was my father's film. So my father, we still don't know exactly how he kept them. We asked him, how did you hold on to them there? It's not clear. We know that he had to barter a little bit of what he had to eat. He had to do different things to keep them. We don't know. And whenever we would ask him, we would say, are you definitely giving You know, anybody speak Yiddish here? A Jew has to find a way. He said, I found a way. But he didn't tell us. So my father told me, "This is I'm sitting there listening with, the, with his tefillin on me. My father said that it was early one morning, like four o'clock in the morning. It was freezing cold. And all of a sudden, they were screaming and yelling, and they came with their dogs barking and hitting us and screaming at us to get undressed. And we thought that they were taking us to shoot us, to kill us. But in fact, they were taking the Jews out to spray them, to delouse them, because they were covered from head to toe with lice. And the Germans were afraid of getting infected. So they were taking the Jews out, and they had them throw out these schmatas they were wearing. And they were taking them to some place to spray them with chemicals. My father thought they were going to be killed. He didn't know what was going to happen. But all he knew was that they had to get undressed, and the Germans were standing there, and he didn't know what to do with his film. He didn't know what to do with his tefillin. So he wrapped the tefillin inside of, the, of those pajamas, whatever they were wearing. He wrapped the tefillin inside. And then they, were pushed, they, pushed, them all, they pushed all the Jews outside of, the, of the, that bunk. And there was a huge pit outside the bunk with a fire. My father said, Ad leva shemayim. A fire that looked like it was going to the heavens. And there was a tractor that was pushing all the shmatas all of the pajamas into the, the infected, into the, into this big pit. My father didn't know what to do. He had, didn't have a choice. They were, the Germans were everywhere. And he put his pajamas down with the tefillin in them on the side over there. And then they were, and then they were yelling and they screaming and they, and he went with, with the rest of the, with everybody else. My father said that at that point, my father was telling us to me at that point, I didn't want to go on living anymore. I wanted to jump into the fire because all I was holding on to was the film. And my father has promised that I would survive if I kept on putting on film. Then my father said that on the way back, they were taking them, they burnt down the whole bunk. On the way back, they were taking them to a different location. They passed by the pit with the fire. And there was only one thing that was sitting on the edge of the pit. And my father said that was his film. He said he doesn't know how because he wrapped it inside the pajamas every single Every single article of clothing was in the fire. And just a film were there. My father grabbed the film. My father said, when you were young, you asked me, how am I still religious? How do I keep Shabbos? How do I eat kosher after what I went through? I never told you an honest answer. It's because of that day when I found my film. That I'm still a kosher religious Jew, and I want you to live that way too. And my father said to me, Maisha, you, never, you should never ever go through any of these things that mommy and I went through. Don't miss a day of tefillin. Shabbat Hashem, I haven't. I should never. You know, my father used to put on those tefillin. After some time, they weren't able to be kosher anymore. The letters couldn't stay. But after we would put on the new tefillin that he bought, when he would come home, he would go to his room and he would put on the old tefillin. Without a bracha. And now when any boy in the shul becomes bar mitzvah, I take the tefillin out from my drawer, which my father gave me those tefillin before he passed away. And I show them to the bar mitzvah boy and I tell them this story. It was my way, it was my father's way of saying to me, Maisha, I was frozen. 
I lost my parents. I lost all my brothers. I lost, I lost my whole life. Everything I had was done. Then all of a sudden, I got this smiley. Or I noticed that smiley sitting by the edge of the pit. That's the light of Hanukkah. That's the warmth of Hanukkah. It, it's the ability that we have, with all that we've each, each one of us has been through in our lives, to remember who we are and to stop the dreidel and to take a look, to take a look at that film that's still there and that reminder that Hashem hasn't forgotten us. There's so much more that I wanted to talk to you about, but it's late. So I just want to leave you with my, with the bracha that comes from the deepest part of who I am, that each one of you should be warmed by the light of Hanukkah. You should be warmed by the fire of this holy place of MJE and the people who are here. You should remember that you have a father who created you, who loves you, and waits for you to come to him and delights in every word that you speak to him and kisses your lips when you say the words of Davani. And in that way, we'll be able to make it through the dark night. And we'll be able to get to the light of Jerusalem, the light of Yerushalayim, and all of us should be able to dance together with King David and all the righteous. And the Jerusalem will be rebuilt. It should be speedily in our times. And have you made our Amen. 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 Amen.